Probably the most common question I'm asked at the moment is, how long is this property downturn going to last? And the second most common question I'm asked is, are we going to have a property market crash like the property pessimists are predicting? If you're wondering something along those lines, you're going to enjoy today's show as I chat with Pete Wargent, and we're going to explain many, many reasons why we believe our property market's aren't going to crash. But we're going to be frank about it and tell you what is ahead. So whether you're a property investor or a homeowner looking to get into property, at the end of the show, you'll be a bit better informed. So welcome to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney podcast, where each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropol, who specialise in helping you grow, protect and pass on your wealth through strategic property advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator, who has once again been voted our leading expert in wealth creation. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. Following a couple of booming years where property values, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, experienced double-digit capital growth, year on year, our markets have moved to the next stage of the property cycle. This is where property price growth has slowed in some cities, and to be honest, property values have fallen, particularly in some locations in Sydney and Melbourne. Now, not surprisingly, this has allowed some of the property pessimists, you know, those on the internet forums, to rub their hands in glee and say, I told you so. Now, but the years out, they've missed all the great booms we had up to now. But sure, our property markets are experiencing a slowdown, but values are still rising in many locations. And while property values are falling in some locations, I don't think we're in for a property crash. So in today's show, I want to have a chat with Pete Wargent to explain why we're not worried a property market meltdown. One of the most frequent questions I'm asked at present is, how long is this slowdown going to Last, and another one is, will our property markets crash? So if you're considering investing in property, or if you're about to buy a home, wouldn't it be good to know the answer to these questions? But firstly, remember, there's not one Melbourne, one Australian property market. Our market's fragmented. Not only is each state at its own stage in the property cycle, but within each state, there are different segments of the market, and they're behaving differently. Some are relate, uh, different because of the geography, others are different price points, others are different sorts of property. So if there isn't one property market. It doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense to say the Australian property market is going to crash. So to look at this topic in a bit more detail, I've got Pete Warchant on the line. Welcome, Pete. Pleasure to be here, Michael, as always. Now, for those who don't know Pete, and you should by now, he's one of my favourite guests on the podcast. He's a chartered accountant, a chartered secretary, and he's got a financial diploma. But while he's got all the credentials, it's, that's not what I like about him, and it's not just his great personality. It's the fact that he's actually used a long-term approach to building businesses, investing in equities and property. So he's got a big picture approach, but similarly, he's actually done it, and he's achieved financial freedom, independence at the age of 33. And I know that because he's become a good friend, and uh, his regular property commentaries and economic commentaries on Property Update are amongst the most read blogs. And I know our high-end clients who join us once a year at Wealth Retreat uh, love Pete's perspective on the property markets. So with all that great introduction, Pete, uh, maybe we could just have a look at what could cause a property crash. Now, to me, a crash isn't the 5, 10, even 15% fall that some locations are getting. What's a crash in the first place, Peter? What would you say? Yeah, well, there's no uh, set definition, but I think um, you'd probably be talking of a, a a correction in prices of 20 to 40%. I think people would start to term that as a property crash. But um yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit the same in the stock market. They talk about official corrections and official bull markets. But as you said, it's a pretty fragmented picture anyway. Um, and some markets are actually rising and others are falling. So for a crash, it would mean that people have to sell their homes but can't find buyers and so therefore the values fall. Now, in the stock market, as you said a second ago, Pete, it's a much more liquid medium, much more liquid assets. So you put it on the stock market and you just uh, sell at whatever price you get. 
we have emotions attached to our property, so it doesn't happen as much. But let's have a talk about what could cause a crash, not what we suggest would. And one would obviously be if there's unemployment so high that it would trigger a, a wave of forced home sales because people couldn't keep up their mortgages. That's not a possibility at the moment, is it, Pete? No, in fact, um, the, the latest unemployment figures were very very positive. Um, so the unemployment rate is now down to 5%. It um, did rise a little bit after the peak of the mining boom, but we're now down to about six and a half year lows. And actually in Sydney and Melbourne in particular, um, the unemployment rates are approaching 4%, so very low. And I think actually you're very fortunate in Melbourne, that would be the strongest economy in the nation right now. Uh, so the Reserve Bank's um, uh, actually updated its forecast this very week, um, and they're now expecting the unemployment rate to fall uh, to four and three quarter percent by 2020. Um, so that that implies that Sydney and Melbourne will be um, well, very very low unemployment rates by then. So one of the factors that could cause a crash would be people just have to sell their homes because they haven't got jobs. That's unlikely. It's not on the cards. Another one would be very high interest rates where. They can't afford to keep their mortgages, uh, so they've got to sell. Uh, but that's not on the cards either, is it? Uh, no, well, not even remotely. So I think um, yeah, the economy is actually growing at about 3.5% this year. It's expected to grow at 3.5% next year, so that's pretty good. But um, inflation is actually under the target range, so there's no prospect of any uh, interest rate hikes anytime soon. Uh, now, we have seen a few tweaks to uh, investor loans and in, particularly interest only loans, but nothing too dramatic. Um, and you can still borrow at four or five percent. So historically, it's very cheap. I think there's probably just one cohort, I think, of investors who might get caught out. And that's people who um, I think have bought sort of off the plan properties using, uh, particularly uh, portfolio investors who bought a, a number of. Uh, properties on interest-only loans, and if they find out that they can't roll those over uh, to new interest-only loans, they might get a bit caught out. But yeah, realistically, high interest rates that cause you know raft of homeowners to default—it's uh, just not happening. Mortgage stress is pretty low. Of course, there's another way that the Reserve Bank or APRA could slow the markets down, but they don't want the market to crash. The banks don't, APRA doesn't, the Reserve Bank doesn't, the government doesn't, but that would be to create a severe credit squeeze. And there have been ones in the past, and while we're all complaining about the credit squeeze at the moment, that's not severe enough to cause a crash. And In my mind, if it was, Pete, they'd loosen the screws. Well, that's right. This has been an engineered slowdown, so push comes to shove. Um some of those um, measures that have been taken can be reversed. Uh, Scott Morrison himself said they could be reversed in an afternoon. Uh, but, I mean, you and I have been around long enough, uh, and especially, uh, unfortunately, for myself being a Brit, uh, actually having seen you know, credit crunches firsthand, you know, genuine credit crunch where the system freezes up and nobody's lending. I mean, this is this is nothing remotely like that, and... Uh, I mean, for home own, home buyers and homeowners, um, mortgage credit is still flowing very freely. Uh, but what um, what APRA has tried to do is just is to wind back interest only mortgages, and um, there's a lot more pressure being applied on um, investors with multiple properties to prove their serviceability. So there's a few things that are being changed at the margin, um, but yeah, it's not a severe credit squeeze. It's just a it's uh, removing some of those excesses. Uh, you, you were talking a moment ago about the interest-only loans, and there was a point of time when so many people were taking interest-only loans, just speculating on continual capital growth, uh, including home buyers, and that probably wasn't a good thing because they were doing that, but buying secondary properties often off the plan or in locations that didn't experience much capital or growth, often for, for quite a few years. So you can understand why the Reserve Bank and APRA tried to stabilise our, our financial system, and that's good for all of us. So while none of us like the credit squeeze, it would be much, much worse to have uh, an unstable banking system. So as we're working through what could cause a crash, before we explain, explain to our listeners why we don't think one's going to occur, another one could obviously be a recession, which would lead to some of the things we talked about before, like uh, uh, unemployment. Um, 
But uh, you've already mentioned the Reserve Bank and recently the International Monetary Fund. Don't see that happening uh, at all. In other words, the recessions where our economy slows down, it's the opposite. We're chugging along nicely. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, Australia, um, the envy of the world in many respects, um, you know, uh, people have been talking about a recession for oh, seven, eight, nine years. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this year we'll, we'll notch growth of about three and a half percent. So not not even remotely close uh, to a recession. Um, yeah, the the um, sort of median forecast for next year, probably about three and a half percent again. Um, so, yeah, there's not really uh, much on the horizon that suggests a recession. Um, and it's worth probably thinking about why. You know, why Australia has been so successful where other countries have, haven't been. And I think, I mean, Australia has just got a, it's got a very good, flexible and open model for the economy. And, um, you know, if things do start to look a bit hairy, well, interest rates can be cut. But we, we have very, very low government debt in this country and a, a AAA rating. Um, so uh, with the budget back towards surplus now, the government can always stimulate and probably the the best thing of all is the the floating Aussie dollar. Um, so we're nothing like Ireland or Spain and these other countries that people love to compare against, because um, Australia's Aussie dollar can absorb shocks, and in fact it has been uh, since the peak of the mining boom. It's come down. Um, so you throw in all of that with a flexible labour force, and the economy has now been well without a recession for nearly three decades. That's right, and it was. Driven by a number of different things, including uh, the mining boom and the Chinese uh, economy, economic boom, and recently, to be fair, the property boom also helped create a lot of jobs. The people that left the mining industries, many of them came to the construction work of the high-rise buildings. And now, Peter, it looks like infrastructure is going to – government spending on infrastructure is going to help our economy in the short term at least. Yeah, so the government's actually uh, quite quietly borrowed quite a lot of money um, in recent years to invest in infrastructure, and that's really helped to offset um, the slowdown uh, from mining construction, as has the housing construction boom. Um, and I think that probably probably leads into the next point, I suppose, is that one of the risks you get at the peak of a market cycle is a sort of a significant oversupply of certain types of property or certain sort of fringe housing estates and I think um, yeah, I mean Australia is a, it's, it's been a, a bit different in that regard but uh, this cycle has been quite unique and that we've seen a lot of uh, construction of high-rise towers just in certain pockets um, so if you take Sydney as, a, as an example uh, you know around Blacktown and the Hills District and Parramatta places like that um, you know there, there has been a lot of the same type of property come onto the market um, at the same time, Docklands the same down your way and, and the inner city of Brisbane. Uh, but that pipeline is now shrunk uh, massively. And um, I think, um, you know, so while there'll be certain types of property that are, get, are hurting a lot now, um, I, I think um, sort of off the plan apartments in some of those areas would be uh, seeing resale values, you know, 20% off the brand new price. Um, but that's not the story for most established properties. I think that's one of the factors that people miss. So there are definitely segments of the Australian property market, and we're looking at you uh, 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 off the plan properties and newly completed projects uh, in particular uh, that have dropped over twenty percent. I've seen that with uh, clients who've not at, on our recommendation, but come for us to try and help them, and we haven't been able to. They've bought off the plan, and valuations come in so so much below uh, the the contract price. But the oversupply has in particular been soaked up by the large population growth. The trouble is these many of these buildings are going to be the slums of the future. They're not the right sort of building that's been built, but they've been not the sort of dwelling most of Australians want, but they've been bought up a lot by overseas investors and local investors. But one of the things that's been pushing up our property markets has been the rising population that's been underpinning it as you said particularly in melbourne and sydney so one of the things that could i'm not suggesting will cause a crash though is a halt to rising population and at the moment it's a bit of a political football isn't it pete but i think both sides of government are at least uh, accepting the fact they're committed to a reasonable level of migration 
Yeah, in fact, both major parties uh, committed to migration, sort of net overseas migration, um, you know, around about 200,000 per annum or so. And with the natural increase in the, the incumbent population anyway, uh, that means we're seeing population growth at around about 400,000 per annum. Uh, so last year, Sydney's population grew by about 100,000. So that's the highest ever figure for Greater Sydney. And Melbourne, well, Melbourne's just been growing at a phenomenal rate, about 125,000. Um, so it's interesting when people talk about you know, an oversupply of property. It's an interesting concept. Um, you know, in my mind, you know, an oversupply is like when they were building speculative housing estates in parts of Europe. I mean, it's, it's a very different dynamic when you've got uh, capital cities growing at 100 to 125,000 per annum. Um, you know, it, it means that it, you know, if you get temporary gluts of a certain type of property, well, you know, they, they'll be chewed up in a matter of weeks. So, uh, yeah, look, um, Sydney and Melbourne are heading towards populations of about eight million by the middle of this century. Um, down in Sydney today, it's just it's just very noticeable now how the city, the inner suburbs, they're just much much busier than they used to be, and there's no sign of that stopping. Sure. Now, one of the other things that could cause a uh, downturn, cause a crash, and we've spoken about it before, is changes to government legislation making property investment less favourable. Having said that, it's unlikely to be changes to government legislation making property ownership for homeowners less uh, popular, and clearly homeowners are the bulk of the market. But uh, there are some... um, well, I guess the odds of a shortened government are shortening at the moment, aren't they? Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, yes. And in fact, this uh, is it's a hot topic at the moment because uh, Labor proposed some changes to the way that investment um, housing is taxed uh, a couple of years ago now when the market was red hot. Uh, they're still pushing ahead with those proposed changes. Um, but uh, yeah, there was a clarification only uh, yesterday by the Tax Institute um, so the, I think the new rules aren't quite what people think they will be. Um, you can still negatively gear established properties if you have um, other income or if you have um, trusts with income and you have property in trusts. Um, so there'll just be so there might be some sort of tweaks to the way in which you might choose to invest, but the fundamental principles won't change. And I think um, you, know, you, you and I have been around long enough to know that things tend to sort of balance themselves out in property markets and things are rarely as good or bad as they seem. Um, And and ultimately, uh, public housing uh, commencements in this country are the lowest level they've ever been now. Um, So, frankly, the government needs investors uh, to keep investing and supplying the rental stock. And if the returns aren't there, then, then people won't do it. So, yeah, the, um, eventually uh, these things come round and that's why we keep having cycles. Pete, you've made a good point because a lot of people don't recognise that in other countries overseas, uh, the government provides a lot more public housing. And it used to, going back uh, many years ago when I grew up, you can think of those large uh, housing commission estates uh, that, that, that they built, often high-rise towers, which actually ended up being social disasters anyway, but they then handed over looking after people who can't afford to buy a house who choose not to, to private investors, people like you and me. Um, And so a much larger percentage of public housing is now provided by mum and dad investors than the government. And the government couldn't take it back. So they are going to require us to keep investing in property. Uh, So you're right, it'll find its own level again, won't it? Yeah, Yeah. that was was an interesting point, actually, because um, I think that was was essentially a policy decision um, two or three decades ago now. Uh, but the amount that the government builds now is it's just slow to a trickle, essentially not even enough to replace the the uh, obsolete and decrepit um, Housing Commission stock. Uh, but just very temporarily, we did see a spike in public uh, housing uh, commencements during the Kevin Rudd stimulus. Um, but of course, you know, we all know, you know how big the budget um, deficit had to blow out to. Uh, to accommodate that stimulus, and there's no appetite for the government to get get involved in all that again. Um, so, but basically, means private investors are the rental market now. 
And the statistics are showing that the percentage of owner-occupiers, which used to hover around 70%, has been decreasing slowly but surely. And there's a number of reasons for that. And it's not just affordability. A lot of it seems to be lifestyle also, Pete, that people are choosing to settle down later, uh, their their rent vesting, or or they're not putting down their roots as early as they used to. There's a range of factors. I mean, uh, people change jobs. They change cities a bit more than they used to when they're young. And um, they did always uh, draw on personal experience. I, I came to Australia when I was, uh, I think, 22 or so. I mean, I was never going to be a home buyer at that age as a new migrant, uh, you know, didn't know where to settle. Uh, like a lot of Brits, I ended up in Bondi, um, very expensive places. And, you know, that's the dynamic in Australia. We've got high rates of immigration. Uh, people overwhelmingly head to Sydney and then Melbourne in that order. Um, so the most expensive housing markets. Um, so I think it's it's a, it's a natural decline in home ownership rates anyway, uh, particularly in those two cities. Um, and eventually, over the, the longer term, you probably expect to see the market quite evenly split between uh, people who own where they live and people who choose to rent. So what we are working on, what we're discussing at the moment is reasons why we don't think the property market is going to crash. It, there's no doubt there is a downturn in certain segments of the market, and we've given you quite a number of things that could cause the market to crash. I can't think of any others, that, unless a world economic disaster where everything goes wrong, but the world economy is doing quite nicely as well. So we've actually had to talk about what could cause it to and why we don't think that'll occur. Maybe we should just go into a bit more detail of the current downturn before we discuss some factors, Pete, that we think underpin the property market and why we're comfortable that uh, the doomsayers are wrong. So when did all this start, this downturn? Yeah, well, I I know that the indexes show something a bit different, but I I can remember quite specifically the the last weekend of February, I actually was down in Sydney um, and I, I attended an auction, I think it was in Bondi, uh, for a, this is February 2017. Yeah, so coming up to two years ago now. Um, and I remember there must have been 60 registered bidders. It was completely insane. Uh, there were far more buyers in the market than, um, you know, they, than could be sustained. And I, I didn't even bother you know, participating in the auction. There was simply no way that you could buy in that environment. Um, but I think the price went something like 600000 over the reserve price. And it, I think um, I mean, that was... That was the highest ever uh, median price uh, for, for auction clearances on that, that weekend. So 25th of February, I think it was. Uh, and 1.5 million, um, there were all thereabouts, was the, the median um, auction price. And I think it had become quite clear at that point that um, the regulators needed to step in because Sydney prices were rising at 15, 20% per annum. Um, and by the next month, APRA had um, introduced, well, it, it's new practice guide, APG 223, and then there were a whole range of measures, you should remember, in March, uh, caps on investor lending, caps on interest-only lending, there were loads of rules about high loan-to-value ratios, and that pretty much wiped that wiped all that froth off the market um, overnight. I, I would say, you know, if you bought two months later, you probably saw that prices were transacting 10% lower just because that sheer... Um, you know that frenzy of buying had just been it's been stopped in its tracks. Um, now the index the, the index will always show something different. I think partly because of the lag uh, the, between buying and settling, uh, they showed that prices didn't slow until I think um, the third quarter. Uh, but to me, that was the peak of the market as you experience it on the ground. Um, and-, oh, and that's the insight that you and I have got that sometimes the researchers don't have. So it's been going on around two years um, and uh, other downturns in general, despite having more uh, poorer fundamentals in the past, crippling interest rates, recessions, etc. they didn't last much longer than two years, did they? No, I think the, the longest ever sort of downturn that Sydney's had in, in, term, in terms of prices uh, was through 1989 to 1991. So it was uh, it was 24 months, so two years, and prices fell by uh, just just under 10 percent, so 9.6 percent. I think it's a bit misleading in some ways to compare to cycles before uh, 
the, the early 90s because we didn't have an inflation target then. So, um, you know, you, you might have had, um, such as in the early 1980s recession, which you'd remember, um, house prices rising at 5%, but inflation was rising at, say, 10 or 12. And, and effectively, that's a, a reduction in prices in real terms. Um, so it's a bit different now because we have lower inflation, of course. Uh, but yeah, the longest um, downturn in prices has been 24 months and just under 10% for Sydney. Now, that doesn't mean that there haven't been longer downturns in other uh, cities that don't have as much market depth. So I think one of the factors that supports Melbourne and Sydney also is the depth of their markets compared to mining towns or even Perth. Um, but I think one of the unknowns is, of course, the uncertainty that's going to lead up to the federal election that's going to be held next year. So that could prolong uh, the lack of consumer confidence, the uncertainty that, that may make this uh, particular downturn last a little bit longer. Um, one of the leading indicators we look for is credit, uh, the ability to get finance, because people try and do that beforehand. Uh, is there any um, hints that you've got there? Yeah, I think um, the, the guys at ANZ actually developed a really, really good forward-looking indicator called, in, uh, called the Housing Credit Impulse. And I just essentially looked at the, it's not the growth in credit, but it's actually the rate of change in growth of credit. So second derivative. Uh, so it's a bit of a, a mouthful. But if you if you track those figures back over uh, decades, the, the correlation to what happens with house prices at least on a national level, which essentially means Sydney and Melbourne, uh, it's very, very close. And um, what the, their um, indicator shows is that uh, the real squeeze on credit, um, that, that troughed out around about June this year. Um, so it's still in negative territory now, but it's getting back towards an even keel. And that's simply because um, the squeeze on investor credit, it's not something that just carries on forever. It's a one-off. It's a one-off change to the way that um, lending happens at, at this point in time. Um, so we've got you know, lo- falling unemployment. Uh, I think wages growth will now start to rise. And eventually, you'll see that um, the housing markets come back into an even an even kind of keel. But it's interesting because, uh, like everyone else, I read all these headlines about you know catastrophe and a 20% crash. And uh, I suppose um, to put my own mind at rest, um, I just did a quick portfolio review and um, in fact, Metropole have managed a number of my properties, as you know, in, in Sydney over the years. And I just did a quick sort of a sense check to see where, where the market was at at Bondi and Darling Harbour and the inner west where, where I own properties. And I, I was astonished to see, I was essentially just saying, well, is that it? You know, prices in Darling Harbour are as high as they've ever been. Uh, Bondi, yeah, prices have come off a bit. The froth has been wiped off, but... Yeah, when you're talking about a you know, catastrophic crash in prices, well, yeah, maybe in some other parts of the country, but not around there. So I think that's a really good point. We've been talking a lot about all the negative factors, but it, I'm seeing two groups of clients come and approach us at Metropole, and the more experienced ones, the ones that have been around the block a few times, the ones who've experienced these things, they're actually happy at the moment that they're able to get in without as much competition because they take a long-term perspective. And uh, I know I'm just seeing my bank manager this afternoon uh, about uh, finalising some things for our next uh, development, Pam and I keeping in the long term. So I've got a long-term focus, but a lot of people, the other half of the people, the newer ones, they're nervous. In fact, a lot of them, when their properties come up for uh, the the tenant moves out, one of the common things people are asking us at Metropolis, should I sell? No, this is just part of the property cycle. Don't change your long-term strategy of wealth creation because of a short-term blip in the market. But there's just so much confusion and lack of confidence at the moment. So I see it as a good opportunity to buy A-grade properties and in homes, a really good time to upgrade your home. It's a good time to buy a good investment property because as you said, Pete, there are markets within markets. So even in Sydney, there are some good opportunities in Melbourne and in Brisbane uh, uh, where you've been based for a few years now. uh, The market's doing very well, but again, very fragmented. Some areas are growing at double the rate of uh, the average uh, reported capital growth. So 
having said that, if we believe that the market is going to do well, let's just have a talk, Pete, about some of the factors that we see as supporting the world, uh, the, the property world. So one of them we've already said is that the world economy is behaving itself. Um, uh, it, there are still some segments of the world economy that aren't doing well, but overall, um, the, the talk of the recession, the world recession, depression of a few years ago, that's all disappeared, Pete. No, that's right. I mean, uh, we've, we've, we've gone into a different climate, so interest rates are, are off the, uh, the zero lower bound in some countries. Uh, even the UK has had a, a very tentative stab at an interest rate rise, but uh, yeah, still uh, still not at 1% yet. Uh, but America is seeing interest rate rise. Uh, but, yeah, the, the global economy is still growing. Uh, there's there's always risks. You know, people talk about, you know, uh, uh, tariff war between China and America. There's always something. That's one thing you'll learn over, over the years. But at the moment, the global economy is growing at a pretty uh, solid pace, uh, especially China and India and lots of countries. Uh, where Australia has exports to uh, China in particular. Um, so from Australia's perspective, things are looking pretty good. I think that's a good point to make, that the, our trading partners' economies are doing much better than the world average economy. So luckily we don't uh, trade as much with the, those European countries and those others that are still having a lot of trouble. And so that, I guess, brings us to another factor that we believe is going to be good. We've already mentioned it. The Australian economy is going to grow well. It's going to continue going well. There's no likelihood of an interest rate rise. And basically, our banking system, despite what the Royal Commission has shown, or maybe because of some of the things that are going to be implemented, our banking system is in pretty good shape, Pete. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you, you can always find people who will tell you the world's ending, but the, the best, um, you know, if you don't believe any uh, any commentators, just look at what the stock market says. And, uh, you know, there's still you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap there. So uh, clearly um, financial markets aren't overly worried. Um, some of the banks saw their share prices come down a bit because they haven't been able to lend as much. Uh, but if you look at their losses on on real estate and, in fact, on all of their assets, their loss rates are extremely low. Um, mortgage delinquency is also low. Um, and, yeah, as you said, there's no real prospect of uh, the Reserve Bank hiking rates anytime soon. So that's all very good. We've already suggested another factor is that employment growth is going to remain strong. Uh, business confidence is pretty good considering uh, uh, consumer confidence isn't that strong at the moment. Um, and uh, tax benefits are coming to businesses now to lower uh, tax rates, which hopefully is going to mean they're going to invest a bit more in inventory, in people, in, in growing their businesses, Pete. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, in fact, the business surveys, which are the most timely indicators, have had um, business conditions and business confidence at well, essentially the highest level we've ever seen. So, yeah, you can always find, uh, if you're looking for doom and gloom, you can always find it. But, um, yeah, I mean, when all's said and done, uh, the economy is still growing pretty nicely. Now, another reason that we believe the property markets are going to not crash is because of the strong population growth. We've mentioned that before. We've also suggested that it's a time when construction is slowing. But I think one of the important factors, Pete, is it's not just population growth, it's actually household formation. So to have another baby as natural population growth doesn't require another dwelling. But if you have the people coming in at the right age, household formation age from overseas, uh, the, the, they're the ones that are going to, in the short term, require, whether it's rental accommodation or, or permanent ownership, but uh, that's going to drive our property markets. Yeah, no, I think this is a really key point because people talk about, um, you know, and this is, you know, right, hedge funds, um, you know, international funds looking at Australia, they they look at macro numbers, you know, X minus Y equals Z or whatever. But this, this is the thing, Australia's immigration is very heavily targeted uh, to essentially people like me when I came over. Uh, they're, they're young. Uh, they're uh, highly skilled, and uh, particularly our visa programs are skewed towards the under 30s. So what we've got, if you look at Australia's population pyramid, uh, we've got an unprecedented uh, surge. We've got millions of people coming into that key uh, first homeowner bracket, sort of age, ages 30 to 35, um, which just is a demographic tsunami, essentially. 
Uh, and yes, some people will continue to rent for a bit longer. Uh, but this is something that's always completely missed in the macro uh, you know, analysis is that the housing market is made up of people forming households. And you know, people always like to think that we're all different from each other, but we're not. You know, We all end up doing very similar things at similar times in our lives. Um, you know, even myself now, you know, settling down, married, two kids. You know, you follow, we follow a fairly sort of predictable trajectory, and that's the thing. We've got millions of people now coming into those first home buyer ages. So we're all unique and different, just like everybody else. <laughs> now, one of the factors is that we've had downturns, but we actually haven't had a proper crash since the late 1890s. We've had lots of corrections, but there's lots of levers the Reserve Bank and government can pull to stop a crash. And if the Labor government does come in, they're not going to want to be known as the government that caused the first housing market crash uh, in, in the centuries. So there's ways of doing it like stimulating first homeowner activity with, with grants, with stamp duty savings, and that tends to be a local government, a state government issue, or, or, or they can lower interest rates or they can stimulate jobs. So there's lots of levers we can pull to stop a crash. Um, but I think one of the factors that some of the overseas commentators miss is the high percentage of home ownership in Australia, the ethos of home ownership, and that homeowners aren't going to give – they'd rather eat dog food than give up their homes or, or, or give back their mortgages to the bank, different to overseas. Yeah, it's changed a bit because, as you mentioned, a lot of people in the under 35 age bracket choose to rent, uh, but the the aspiration of home ownership has never gone away, and that's why it causes so much angst and there's so that's why every – Housing market article is the most read on the Fin Review and Sydney Morning Heralds because it's a it's a thing that everybody still aspires to in Australia. Is um, as you said, it's a it's a part of the the fabric of Australian society to that desire to own your own home. So it it does have a, a strong uh, effect on housing markets. Britain is exactly the same. Uh, always had that um, tradition that you try to pursue home ownership. Uh, it's different in other parts of the world, though, um, as parts of countries like Germany and so on. But for Australia, um, home ownership is still uh, as key as it ever was. That's one of the things that's going to help support our property markets, homeowners buying properties similar to the ones we want to buy to keep the value of our properties going up. And that's, again, why, in my mind, an investment-grade property is one that's uh, an owner-occupier property. H having said that, there's – something that people keep bringing up, and that's the level of household debt. Uh, and from my reading of the Reserve Bank's notes and minutes and uh, what uh, the Reserve Bank governors are saying is that in general, while household debt has gone up, it seems to be in the hands of the people who can afford it more, Peter. Yes. Yeah. And I think if you look at the increase in household debt um, over the last two decades, it's, it's largely been in those um, – in those um, the upper two quintiles, essentially, of people by um, by income. So it's basically uh, the higher income earners have borrowed more, uh, some of them for investment property. Um, but that's why you know, there's a lot of talk about mortgage stress and it never seems to show up in any delinquencies. Well, that's why, because the people who have the debt uh, have been able to service it very easily. And in fact, um, yeah, if you, if you actually look at... Um, the, the way that household debt has increased. Well, it's a bit misleading because a lot of people now use mortgage offsets and buffers, um, and there's a lot of unseen uh, buffer there. So if you actually looked at the net level of household debt um, against incomes, well, it hasn't really increased for a dozen years. It's just that you know, a lot of people have been uh, using sort of buffers and offset accounts uh, to store their money these days. The other thing is over the last couple of years, there has been more responsible lending. So even though people have been taking on debt, the banks have only lent it to people who could service the debt if interest rates go up a couple of points, and we know that that's unlikely to happen. But there is that concern, Pete, of the interest-only loans converting to P&I loans. Uh, and while people are worried about that, I know that your research seems to suggest that's not as big a concern. Yes, if you actually, uh, so as you said, at the peak of the market, 2015, um, there was something like 40% of all loans were interest only, of new loans. Um, uh, and 
the the total stock of outstanding mortgages uh, was about 40% interest only. So it's very high in international terms. And that's largely a function of the tax system in Australia, where you get a deduction for your mortgage interest on investment properties. Um, but after I got a bit uncomfortable with that. Um, but it, the thing is, um, you'd expect five years on from the peak, that's when there would be the bulk of resets, um, because that's the nature of the mortgage product in Australia. But actually, an awful lot of people have switched early um, to get cheaper mortgage rates. So um, the, the stock of outstanding uh, interest only debt has gone from 40%, we're probably pretty close to 25% now, which is the lowest we've seen in well, it's a multi decade low. Uh, so essentially, the cliff, the feared cliff, has already happened. Um, now, there might be some ongoing uh, impact with energy being sucked out of the market because people have to pay back more debt these days. Uh, but the, the big cliff of uh, resets, well, it happened, it came and went. <laughs> So it's interesting, we've spent quite some time talking about what could cause a crash, and we've also explained why we don't think that's going to happen, why uh, it's an orderly, organised, orchestrated soft landing. Now, I know for those people who bought the house just before the boom in Sydney and if their property values dropped a bit to them, it's not a soft landing. But for the vast majority of people who've actually enjoyed the experience of the property booms in Melbourne and Sydney, uh, even if properties drop back a bit, they're still so, so far ahead. So yes, I believe over the next 12 months, we're still going to have some interesting times. But uh, our research similarly suggests that middle of next year, late next year, things are going to even out. And there's not going to be a sudden boom in Sydney and Melbourne, but there are lots of locations that are still going to go well. And don't worry, there's always going to be doomsays. And don't allow the overseas people to compare the overseas markets with our ones. I know for a number of years now, the bubblers and doomsayers have been predicting the bursting of Australia's property bubble. They've told us we're denying the impending gloom uh, and we're blinded by the consistent performance of our property markets for the last few years. But Pete and I aren't talking about the last few years. We're actually talking about long-term historical information. We've explained what could cause a crash, but we've also explained why we don't think you need to be worried about a crash. Of course, you've got to be vigilant. As investors, you need to be aware of what's happening in the world's economies. You need to be aware of what's happening in Australia's economies because Australia doesn't operate in isolation from the rest of the world. And you need to be cognizant of what's happening in your local property markets. And as I said, remember, there's not just one property market, some locations, particularly Brisbane and other states. Canberra's doing really well. Hobart's still performing nicely. Some are going to outperform. Interestingly, BIX, BIS Oxford recently predicted Brisbane's going to do 11% growth between now and 2021. So I guess the bottom line is strategic investors are going to take advantage of the opportunities our property markets are going to offer. And there will be great opportunities over the next couple of years to maximise your upside, but you've definitely got to protect your downside by having the right finance structures. You've got to be able to see yourself through this market and you've got to know that the rules are changing a bit. And I think cash flow is going to be very, very important. Pete, thank you so much for your time. And maybe we could just finish off by your thoughts about the importance of cash flow, because I think that's one of the traps. If you've got the cash flow, you're going to get through. Yeah, that's it. I I always think that there are essentially four ways to avoid getting caught out by uh, you know, these um, temporary downturns. The first thing is don't get involved in a bidding frenzy because people do that. They see red hot markets and they think they must buy today because it'll be more expensive tomorrow. But avoid that. Um, buy established properties, not new, because you'll pay too much for brand new properties. Yep. Uh, buy in areas where the supply is constrained because when markets turn at the peak, it's always those that are supply responsive. So the high rise towers, the fringe housing estates. If they, you know, almost by definition, more people buy at the peak and then the downturn hurts more people. Uh, so don't, don't do that. Buy in supply constrained areas like Sydney's eastern suburbs, for example. And finally, and that's the, the point you were making is don't borrow what you can't afford to repay. So make sure that the cash flow stacks up uh, because then, you know, downturns just don't touch you. Um, it's people who are forced sellers that end up losing in property. Well, now that you've heard my chat with Pete Wargent, I hope you're not worried about a property market crash and you're better informed about some of the fundamentals that are going to protect the value of your home, my home and our investment properties. 
Now, I'd like to read out two reviews I received over the last little while. We get regular reviews, most of them five-star reviews. And I want to say thank you for all the people taking the time and effort to leave that because a part of my aim in putting this podcast together is to inform people to stop them making the property investment mistakes I see so many making. Part of my job is to help educate you. And I'd love you to keep passing the message on by telling some of your friends and leaving reviews to make uh, others find out about the show as well. So when you leave a review, if I read it out, I'm going to always say thank you by gifting you one of my books. All you've got to do is email me at michael at metropole.com.au when you hear the review. And again, as I said, if you could pass on the message to somebody by sharing the podcast, if you liked it. And if you didn't like it, tell me anyway. I'd love to hear also, see what I can improve. Now, the first one I want to read out today comes from Jose21. Michael's so generous with his knowledge, I can't believe this is a free resource. I've learned so much about property and wealth creation from this podcast, along with his books. This is the sort of advice worth hundreds of thousands of dollars if you actually listen and take action, more importantly. And you're right, Jose. Yes, you can't just listen. You actually have to take action. The power of the information is in the implementation of it, isn't it? Anyway, Jose kept went on to say he's also got some great advice about mindset. A plus, by far the best podcast out there. I'm on my second lap. Well done, Jose. And there's another one from Zier1991 who said, exceptional content. I highly recommend it for anyone who's interested in property investing. Looking forward to the next one. Well, you're going to get the next one next week. I'm here every week to help you learn a bit more about property investment in success and money. I look forward to catching up with you again next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property advice. If you got value from today's show, we'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review and we'll read it out on a future show and Michael will gift you one of his books as a way of saying thank you. Just go to michaelyardneypodcast.com forward slash review and let us know what you think. If you don't already subscribe, head over to iTunes or your favorite Android app. You'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast. If you'd like to gain instant access to the show notes, head across to michaelyardneypodcast.com. Watch out for our show next week. You'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. Thank you.